All right. There's still people coming in to the wait through the waiting room. I'll just wait a couple more minutes or a couple more seconds, and then we'll get started. Um, I can watch the waiting room. Okay. Um, but they should all, yeah, I, I want to wait for them to come in. Um, but my name is Madeline Hoffman, and I'm the co-chair of the Green Party U.S. Peace Action Committee and a longtime peace and justice and environmental activist. And I'm very... Going over in this other room. I'm very happy um, to welcome you all tonight to our webinar on um, Mideast Wars Rising, uh, when will the killing stop? And this is a second um, webinar that we had, uh, that we've held rather, on the issue of the Middle East and Gaza. And the first one we held was in December, shortly after the humanitarian pause that lasted about a week from November 23rd to the 1st of December. And um, while that was a welcome relief for the people of Gaza, it was definitely not enough. And right now, you know, people are calling for a ceasefire very strongly all over the world. And they're not calling for a humanitarian pause. They're not um, in agreement with Kamala Harris saying we're going to have a six, a six week humanitarian pause. People are calling for a permanent ceasefire um, to allow for um, there to be a political a di diplomatic solution to the problems that exist. And as we've all been watching day after day after day, um, for now over 150 days, we see the atrocities mount. We see, unfortunately, forgive me, we see the corpses mount. We see um, people starving and we see Israeli tanks and snipers going after people who are waiting in line because they're starving. They're looking for humanitarian aid and they can't even be secure in the fact that they will be getting that humanitarian aid. What the way that the that the Israelis <laughs> uh, the, the way the Israelis are responding. Um, so I think that the timing of this is, wait a minute, now, what's Arabic doing on the screen? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, I have to confirm my speaking, our, our speaking language, okay? Somehow it got changed, now we're good. I used to speak Arabic, <laughs> but I've, I studied for five years, but I forgot everything I knew, so I can't really speak in Arabic anymore. But anyway, um, we're here, um, tonight to uh, what seems to be a very timely, what is a very timely um, webinar. And um, well, and, and March 10th, which is right around the corner, is the beginning of Ramadan. And the Israelis have somehow put that forward as a date, you know, a key date for them and not a key date for them to observe Ramadan, but a key date for them to move in um, and invade Rafa. And this is also something that I think the, the whole world, other than Israel and um, Joe Biden and his administration, want to avoid. Um, because the genocide that has been committed against the Palestinian people is already over the top, oops, I shouldn't say over the top. Um, someone else we know said that and it didn't look, it didn't work very well. Um, it, it, the, it's horrendous. What's been going on in, in Gaza is horrendous. And so um, 
I'm very excited to present uh, this group of speakers tonight. Um, and also, before we do that, I'm very excited to introduce um, the co-moderator, and that will be Nora, Nora Corey. Um, can we spotlight Nora? Okay, oh, we're both spotlighted. That's cool. All right, so I'm going to introduce Nora, and then Nora is going to introduce the speakers. And then, you know, what we're going to do uh, is we're going to have all the speakers. I think there are five of five of them. Five. And then we'll do a question and answer uh, session. Um, Jim Beckland, who's up there on the top of the screen, he's going to keep you honest, all speakers. He's going to let you know when 10 minutes are up. Um, and then after everyone has spoken, we're going to have a question and answer session. Uh, and we'll see how long that goes. But Jim is also going to be a timekeeper for that. All right, so I'm very happy to introduce the co-host, co-moderator with me, Nora Khoury. Nora Khoury is Palestinian, uh, the, a part of the Palestinian diaspora, currently residing on Ohlone land in Oakland or Oakland, California. Uh, she has worked for more than the past two decades as a community organizer in California. She lived for two years each in Palestine and in Egypt, where she witnessed the devastating impacts of US foreign policy on the region. She currently serves on the National Committee of al Auda, uh, Palestine, the uh, uh, Committee of al Auda, the Palestine Right to Return Coalition. Nora? Thank you so much, Madeline. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, I wanted to start, just uh, take a few minutes to ground us in some context and maybe some history that brought us to this current moment um, as I see it, um, because this didn't come out of nowhere and a vacuum, right? So last summer, um, I co-organized, I organized and was planning to co-lead an Olive Harvest delegation to the West Bank in October because I was so concerned about the levels of violence, which before October 7th, we hadn't seen on that scale since following uh, the second Intifada in the early 2000s when we witnessed elderly and uh, vulnerable people who couldn't escape in Janine and all around uh, the area being bulldozed to death in their homes and the massive bombardment and growing isolation and closure of the entire region. I was so upset and horrified by the violence and impunity um, that Israel enjoyed, it became abundantly clear to me at that moment that the so-called leaders of the world were what we were waiting for were not going to save us um, and that I needed to drop everything, commit, my, commit myself to the change um, I wanted to see. So I went to Palestine for my first time and joined the ISM, the International Solidarity Movement to stand with Palestinians as they resisted nonviolently on their land. At that time, we thought it couldn't get any worse, but then over the subsequent two decades, uh, we witnessed a severe escalation of human rights violation, use of banned weapons, increase in land confiscation, home seizures, and all the right-wing settler violence um, that we're witnessing that continues to grow unchecked, never once called into question by the US tax dollars and arms uh, used to fund all of this violence. So uh, this then culminated, of course, in the shocking pogroms and burning of entire villages that we saw taking place before October 7th. Uh, so in a essence, just what this green lighting of these decades of continued unconditional support and unlimited weapons have sent as a clear message um, to the worst elements of the Israeli society that there are no red lines. So meanwhile, we today continue uh, to watch in absolute horror and devastation as over 30,000 Palestinians have been senselessly murdered and up to 100,000 missing or buried under the rubble. And the entirety of Gaza is just devastated and destroyed, um, making it abundantly clear that the um, 
the um, administration and the media uh, establishment has made it abundantly clear that they remain unmoved and they're in fact more outraged over the lies of hundreds of Israeli babies that were never beheaded than over the 10,000 babies that were clearly massacred by Israel with US weapons. And these reports of sexual violence and mass rapes that even the New York Times is now having to admit that never happened or nor has there been a shred of evidence, uh, reliable evidence to corroborate. The one single but significant silver lining during this time is the incredible groundswell of support from the millions of people and grassroots movement throughout the world calling for a ceasefire, which is just the baseline of demands, and it is just astonishing that anyone can oppose it, and yet here we are. It has been made abundantly clear to those that actually want to see an end to the killing that an enduring political solution is desperately what is needed to get to the root of the problem. Yet, instead of working with the people, these brave uh, political um, leaders, students, and community members are being doxxed, bullied, and criminalized by the powers that be for daring to stand up and speak out. So I think the question at hand um, to our esteemed panel is when the, of when the killing will end is an important one, as well as what precisely it will take to end it. So to answer the uh, question, um, first we will start with um, um, Matthew Ho, who is a senior fellow with the Center of International Policy since 2010. In 2009, Matthew resigned in protest from his post in Afghanistan with the State Department over the American escalation of the war. He's a disabled veteran of the US Marine Corps who served in Iraq. Matthew, please take it from here. Thank you, Nora. Uh, and thank you all for including me uh, tonight. I was asked to talk about a couple different things. And um, the first, th first thing I'll talk about is uh, about the region, about what effect this will have on the region overall. And I want to preface that with just two things before I begin. One, I'm not an expert in the Middle East, and uh, if I'm not certainly not an expert on these individual countries. If I'm an expert on anything, it's on aspects of the American empire. So if you uh, perceive that that's how my uh, explanation and analysis is covered, well, uh, there you go. Uh, the, uh, the other thing, too, is what I want to get to uh, with uh, my, my comments is that as we watch the unipolar world come to an end, as we watch uh, the American empire come to a close, become a historical event, we have to be clear-eyed about the complexities of what comes next. Shifting from a unipolar world to a multipolar world will have its, uh, its complexities, uh, to, to, to put it simply. Uh, so I just want to give you uh, my overview of the region uh, as I see it, as it's being affected in the next couple of years by this current genocide in Gaza. Uh, so the clear determination of the U.S. to side with Israel, regardless of consequences, or reduce U.S. influence in the region while providing an opportunity for other nations to increase their influence. Within the region, we see Qatar attempting through mediation efforts to solidify a role with worldwide significance, akin to the role for which Switzerland where the Scandinavian nations once were held in high esteem. President Erdogan of Turkey has utilized this crisis to promote himself as a defender of Muslims, although his country's actual efforts have been minimal, at least overtly. Meanwhile, Ansar Allah, the de facto government of Yemen, has earned the admiration of people throughout the region and many worldwide in standing up to the U.S. and attempting to do something about Israel's genocide by blockading the Red Sea. Iran hopes this crisis will lead to a withdrawal of U.S. forces from Iraq and possibly Syria, which would free Iran of the U.S. presence in its neighbor and strengthen its Syrian ally. Iran, competing with Erdogan and Ansar Allah, wants to come out of this as a champion, if not the defender, of the people of the Middle East. The Iranians may do it themselves, as Americans have on many occasions, by believing they can manage war for their purposes, doing just enough not to cause themselves harm or ignite an inferno again, as the Americans have done so many times in their hubris. Saudi Arabia, in public, has been more quiet than anticipated. Still, Riyadh certainly entertains the desire to see itself 
in that role of leader of the Muslim people of the Middle East, putting it into conflict for that title with Iran and Turkey. Such competition with Iran could do damage to last year's China-mediated reproachment while juxtaposing the crown prince versus Erdogan among the Sunnis. See, that certainly seems dangerous regardless of the outcome. Egypt will do everything it can not to lose its billions in military funding from the U.S. while trying hard as possible not to absorb Palestinian refugees. Both Saudi Arabia and Egypt, along with the Palestinian Authority, are involved in meetings over the future of Palestine. The needs and aspirations of the Palestinians are not much more than talking points for those powers. Nations with U.S. military presence like Jordan, the UAE, and Bahrain hope no one notices the U.S. bases and the warplanes and drones that fly from them. Lebanon sits and awaits what war might bring. Hezbollah is prepared for sustained battles along the border or a decisive war. This all might push Turkey, Egypt, and or Saudi Arabia to acquire a nuclear weapon, with T Turkey the most conceivable to me. The current government in Tel Aviv sees an opportunity to enter the final phases of an eight-decade-long campaign for greater Israel. Depending on if the current government holds, will determine whether that goal of ethnic cleansing is achieved to include, eventually, East Jerusalem and the West Bank, and quite possibly Southern Lebanon. Regardless of whether the current government stays in power or not, Israel, as Fortress Israel, will only become more entrenched, relying on its lobby's control of the U.S. Congress and White House and the backing of the world's reserve currency. The estimation is that as long as Israel has the U.S., it can be as strategically reckless as it needs to achieve its goals of greater Israel, regardless of the geopolitical, security, and economic costs. For reasons of politics and pseudo-religious melding of American exceptionalism and American evangelicalism, excuse me, the U.S. will go along with Fortress Israel for many American election cycles to come. A failing empire, the U.S. will only be able to offer its firepower and promises of money to those in the region as nations, individually and collectively, work to escape American hegemony. Structures like BRICS and de-dollarization, admittedly a long process, are chief among efforts to weaken the empire. The Russians sit aside their ally in Damascus and hope to see the Americans enter into a quagmire that will make the U.S. occupation of Iraq seem like a puddle in comparison. The Russians will seek to advance trade deals and open new markets that they have successfully done so since their Ukrainian inv invasion. They will keep their Navy, Air Force, and Spetsnaz at Syrian ports, airfields, and garrisons, and their Wagner forces available for employment elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Damascus can only try to recover from the trauma of their war. China has the most to gain of any power outside the region, and will likely try to continue to present itself as a calm, reasonable, and reliable guarantor of stability, development, and diplomacy. It's probably been noticed that I did not mention the Palestinians or the Iraqis. Tragically, I view them as continuing to be at the mercy of the decisions and fates of others. As Thucydides said, the strong do what they can while the weak suffer as they must. That's certainly not where my heart is, but that's when I look at this region the American empire, how things have been going and how I think things will, will go. Unfortunately, that's the way I see it going in the next few years. I was also asked to talk about Aaron Bushnell. Uh, one of the aspects of the American empire I do know uh, something about is the great cost of the empire, how it crushes people, how it crushes communities, crushes societies, both overseas and of course here at home. Uh, Aaron Bushnell, is one of those costs. Um, I had this statement last week that I'll, I'll read as opposed to try to speak off the cuff because I'll easily blow through my allotted time if I do. It's important to note Aaron Bushnell's self-immolation was not just an act of resistance to genocide and a statement of non-complicity. It also came from the pain and distress caused by the great and wide wreckage of this war and all wars. The moral injury Aaron was enduring, by, was enduring by being part of a military whose purposes were not the interests of the American people, but rather the political, economic, and financial interests of the American empire, and the great harm and suffering that those interests bring to so many millions of people, is a pain and distress felt by generations of American veterans. The guilt, shame, and regret that compose moral injury are a leading cause of veteran suicides, particularly among combat veterans. 
Aaron realized he was not wearing a white hat, but a black one. The distress and guilt caused by that realization, coupled with his desire to stand resistant to the genocide in Gaza, led to his act of self-immolation. We have to be careful not to celebrate his death for this act of self-immolation is an extension and agent of the wicked violence of this war in Gaza and his loss, like the loss of like the tens of thousands killed in the war, is an act of permanent destruction and moral desecration. We should honor his act of sacrifice while recognizing the moral injury he was suffering and utilize his memory to sustain our resistance to genocide, war, and occupation. I apologize for just reading it, everything like that. But again, if I had tried to stay within the 10 minutes and cover all that, I would have uh, not just forgotten a lot. I would have rambled and I uh, would have blown through my 10 minutes. So uh, uh, I, I appreciate, again, being included in this. I look forward to Q&A and, and certainly I look forward to, to hearing what uh, my colleagues have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. Yeah. Um, for raising just the important um, contradictions of this empire and just the um, the hope of the multi uh, the unipolar world turning into a multipolar world, I think that is um, the future of uh, what's clearly uh, unfolding. And uh, the question uh, we're all asking is how many more lives and um, people need to sacrifice, be sacrificed for this empire um, to to die <laughs> um, a a relatively peaceful uh, death. Um, I think the question, the choice is ours uh, truly as humanity in this moment. Um, so uh -huh. next speaker we have uh -huh. um, is Bob Suberi. The son of immigrants from Jerusalem, Bob is a dual citizen of the U.S. and Israel, a Vietnam War vet, and a member of the Green Party in St. Louis. He spent three months living in a Palestinian village from March to June 2021. He is currently active in Veterans for Peace, Friends of Bethlehem St. Louis, and the Center for Jewish Nonviolence. Bob? Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. I want to thank everybody for being here. I also want to especially thank uh, GPAX for organizing this event. Um, it's great to be in the company of these people. Um, let me start by just clearing up a few of my own misconceptions. Um, uh, misconceptions I had before spending any time in the West Bank. Um, like you, Nora, I, I go there every year and I spent time working with other activists, met a lot of ISM people. They were great. Uh, one got deported. In fact, when I was there the last two months, uh, they arrested her and um, she was deported the next day for aiding Hamas, by the way. Knew her well, great gal. Uh, anyway, these misconceptions that I had, uh, one, it's not a conflict. Uh, with such an overwhelming imbalance in power, cannot be called a conflict. Uh, in Gaza, you've got two nuclear superpowers attacking a refugee camp, and I just can't wrap my head around that, that the world looks at it and, oh, that's okay, yeah, got to get Hamas. Uh, also, it's... Um, it's not complicated. It's complicated by design. It's del a deliberate attempt to muddy the waters and justify the violence uh, committed on, on the part of the Israeli state. Uh, three, I, there's no cycle of violence. The pattern as I see it is that Israel intentionally provokes situations to get a reaction. You know, then they come in with the, uh, the big guns. Uh, the occupation is a 57-year provocation. Um, Nonviolent demonstrations are met with overwhelming force to pursue the continuing displacement and cantonization of Palestine. It's, and also, it's disingenuous to blame all the violence on settlers. Uh, the IDF works hand-in-hand -hand with the settlers. Sometimes they protect them, sometimes they, you know, participate, you know, in the violence. Uh, 
but they worked together to rep repress Palestinians. And since October 7th, settlers have been wearing army uniforms, brandishing automatic rifles supplied by the IDF. And many times you can't tell the difference between the two. Uh, what we're seeing in Gaza right now is the extent to which Israel and its US enabler um, are willing to go to acquire all the land without a Palestinian presence. The West Bank will soon contain multiple Gazas uh, as Palestinians are forced off their, uh, off their uh, rural land, their farmland, uh, and herded into densely populated and easily controlled urban areas. Um, my trips to uh, Masafir Yata started in 2019. Now, Masafir Yata is in the southern part of the West Bank. It's, it's, it's below Hebron, and it's the area around the city of, uh, of Yata. Um, I, uh, I returned on November 7th, a month after October 7th, and stayed for uh, two months. I have very close friends there, and I was very concerned about them. Uh, I've been going back every year. I hooked up with Israeli and international activists, ISM, providing ad hoc protective presence um, in around 10 different villages. Um, in the time allowed, I couldn't possibly recount all I saw. Uh, but basically, there's a lockdown that is completely strangling the Palestinian economy. And, and as a result, their well-being, both physically and mentally. Roads are blocked. Uh, all the roads are blocked going into most of the cities and villages, except for one access road. And I'm talking about Ramallah, Hebron, Yatta. Uh, so it's very difficult to move around. Um, uh, then there are also checkpoints at the entrances uh, to the cities and villages, making it almost impossible for Palestinians to go to work, to go to school, to make medical appointments, uh, shop, attend their farms, because you just never know when you're going to be able to. Uh, the Israeli civil administration could and would and did arbitrarily close the checkpoints, uh, in which case no one could enter or leave cities. It took me two hours to get three miles while I was trying to enter Ramallah. Uh, access to agricultural fields and grazing land has been blocked, either mechanically or, or they're, they're blocked by individuals. The law telling Palestinians they can't be there. Uh, there are arbitrary arrests of villagers, uh, which is widespread in daily. Uh, there are patrols by the army and settlers, and sometimes both, uh, through Palestinian villages, and they occur day and night. Over the years, I've gotten to know the residents of the village of Um al -Kher. I've spent a lot of time there, and I've gotten to know them on a very, very personal level. Though I was frequently, frequently with activists in other villages, this village kind of came, became my home and part of my extended family. I stay in touch with them on almost a daily basis, even today in St. Louis. Uh, when I first arrived um, in Umacher, there, uh, uh, a settler by the name of Betzalel Talia had just terrorized the village. He assembled all the men in the village, handcuffed them, made them kneel and pledge allegiance to Israel, humiliating them before their families and, and their friends. Uh, then he let them go. Later, he entered the homes of Palestinians during dinner time when the families were gathering uh, to eat. In one home, that of a close friend of mine, he and his friends stepped on the food they were eating and 
just vandalized their home. They broke cabinets. They threw crap everywhere while, you know, threatening them should they should they resist. Needless to say, the children were terrorized. Uh, the parents were left feeling extremely helpless and scared. Betsilel Talia, the, the um, settler that did this, is the son of Yaakov Talia, a South African white that left South Africa at the end of apartheid in search of opportunities elsewhere. Well, he found the occupied West Bank and he founded the settlement named after him, the settlement of Talia. And it's become a source of terror and, and, and obstacles in, in doing anything in Masafriyata for, for Palestinians. A few days after that event, uh, a 17 year old resident of Umatir, a kindly sweet soul was abducted by settlers in, in army uniforms, we found out later. Um, he was taken somewhere we, we didn't know, they didn't say, we couldn't find out. Uh, he was tortured overnight in a remote outpost. He was left outside in the winter cold and prevented from sleeping by flashing lights, strobe lights and loud noise. They beat him, they sexually molested him and they rubbed their fingers in his eyes till he couldn't keep them open anymore. When we found him, he was totally broken and exhausted. Excuse me, Bob, but you have uh, one minute to finish your thoughts. Okay, <laughs> I'll never finish them. <laughs> uh, I, there was an ever present, I want, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll skip some of the particular incidents, but there was an ever present anxiety throughout all the villages we went to, um, uh, no one knew what to to expect, but they knew it was coming. Some of my friends admitted to me privately that they were broken in spirit and had no hope. Um, I could go on for hours talking about, um, you know, incidents. Uh, it's really sad and uh, but I think if I'm going to leave you with a thought, it's my respect and admiration for the Palestinian people I lived and worked with, how they maintain their composure, levity, and devotion to their families in view of the perpetual intimidation and humiliation and violence that they face is something I found really hard to fathom. I can't imagine being imprisoned there as they are yet determined to resist the theft of their homeland. In many ways, the, the West Bank I, you know, I saw as one of the ugliest places on earth, and in other ways, one of the most beautiful. Mm. And I would encourage all of you to go visit. And, um, and my, uh, yeah, I could go on, but, uh, and I just wanted to thank Matthew Ho. I, I saw um, um, a video you did some years ago, and and your impression, what you kept repeating, uh, you were Nabi Sala, and, and one of the things you kept saying is that they're such cowards. They're such cowards. And that was exactly my impression of, of these settlers, because they hide behind the army, and then the army attacks. The settlers will attack. And then the army uh, will come in to protect the settlers and continue attacking the Palestinians. It's unbelievable. But anyways, I'll, I'm over time. Thank you all. Thank you so Mara, much. Mara, can I ask something, um, please? Yeah, two things. One is Christina is having uh, problems with her laptop and she's going to be signing in on a phone and hopefully she'll be doing that shortly. Um, uh, but I wanted to say going back to some of the things that were said earlier, um, we know the long history of 75 years. I don't 
you know, and, and a lot of the things that have occurred in those 75 years. And somebody mentioned earlier when, uh, in response to some of the history that was being given, that during that great march of return, people were protesters were being shot and killed when as they approached the as they approached the divider, the dividing, the arbitrarily placed fence that keeps them penned in. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing I wanted to mention. And the other thing I wanted to mention, as if we need a reminder, I don't think most of us here do need that reminder is that our own government, uh, the US government, Joe Biden and his administration continuously, continuously have been voting against ceasefires um, three times, three times. And, um, you know, it's at the last time it was, they were the only obstacle in between, you know, a ceasefire and, um, and the killing and the genocide. They were the only the only obstacle that, you know, they were they were just, oh, well, we're gonna do our own thing. Yeah. Um, so um, you know, this this is a problem, and this is why people um around the world are looking at the United States as the most dangerous country. Um, the United States and Israel together, um, because of the way they've they've conspired. Um, and work together uh, on, on this genocide. And then the other, the other thing that got the whole world um, thinking about it, um, thinking about what was going on, is that um, the airdrop, the airdrop of food. <laughs> the U.S. You know, was very cynical and sent of the U.S. to do that as. And this, I think the consensus is that that was uh, just for show, to try to make it seem like the U.S. cared. When in the fact, if the U.S. withdrew the funding, um, withdrew the funding from Israel and withdrew the weapons from Israel, this could stop tomorrow. It could just stop tomorrow. All right. So yeah, um, I still. I don't, I think we'll move on to Amali and then when Christina gets here, um, we'll add her and uh, we'll, we'll ask her to, to join us, but I, um, I don't think we should wait any longer. Um, so why don't you introduce, Nora, why don't you introduce Amali? Oh, but you're muted. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline, and thank you, Bob. I agree. Going uh, to witness and stand um, with Palestinians on the ground is probably one of the most important and life-changing things you could ever do. Um, just the resilience and the level of hospitality and warmth um, is unparalleled and is what committed me to, um, you know, my my journey um, for life, basically, um, after being on the ground there. So our next speaker is Amali Yushitala. I'm sorry if I got that wrong. A co-founder and current chairman of the African People's Socialist Party, which leads the Uhuru movement. He is currently under U.S. indictment for allegedly spreading Russian disinformation in a case that will test the government's ability to suppress free speech, one of many that we should all be paying attention to. Amali has been an outspoken advocate for Palestinian rights. Uh, welcome, Amali. Uhuru, uh, thank you very much. I'd like to express my appreciation uh, to the Green Party. Uh, for inviting me to participate in this discussion and uh, for uh, the support that I have got, me and the two co-defendants uh, in this uh, case, uh, where the U.S. government uh, has uh, continued and intensified the colonial attack on African people uh, through the African People's Socialist Party and the Uhuru Movement. And I appreciate the fact that you've extended them to me a few more minutes to say something about the case. I'm going to try and 
uh, put all of this together into a single presentation. First of all, I want to say uh, free Palestine, every square inch from the river to the sea, including that occupied territory currently known as Israel, free Palestine from the river to the sea. Uh, the shameless murder of Palestinian people being conducted by white colonial power is at the moment the greatest example of white nationalist colonial democracy on this plate in the world. Secondly, I want to make a declaration that we, all of us, must unite to demand the freedom of Leonard Peltier. Free Leonard Peltier, not another year. All people should make this demand but I think it's especially true for African people in this country. We say this not only because the nearly 50 year imprisonment is unjust, but because Africans and the indigenous people of the so-called Americas are linked together by blood and a common history and a common destiny. The fact is that when Africans were brought to these shores at gunpoint as colonially enslaved people the indigenous people were the only friends that we had. Our relationship is based on blood and common interests. Just as we are irretrievably connected to our motherland, Africa, as central to the liberation of African people, we are also part of the revolution of the Americas to which we were forcibly dispersed from Africa during the construction of the colonial mode of production. American capitalism rests upon the twin pillars of African and indigenous colonialism. The stolen labor of black people, the stolen land of the indigenous people. The fact is America is the largest settler colony in the world. And that uh, settlerism, uh, listen to Comrade Bob talk about how the settlers are acting uh, in occupied Palestine. Uh, we've seen it before. We've lived with it all our lives. Uh, and it's, a, it's a necessary uh, in order to maintain the domination of a colonial uh, settler population. So I wanted to also say that um, all of this, uh, the attack on the Uhuru movement, the attack on me, the Penny Hess, Jesse Neville, uh, who are settlers who betrayed uh, the interests of settler colonialism and united with the struggle against colonized people, uh, all of us, uh, uh, innocent of the charges being made against us, uh, but victims of a settler colonial state power uh, that is determined to maintain uh, uh, its domination, not only in this country, but of the world at the time of serious kinds of crisis that is faced. And I've heard people reference that. I think Matthew Ho talked about uh, something about the state of the crisis, although, and I think that's extremely important. The other thing I want to say is that the missing thing perhaps up to now that's been talked about uh, in this discussion, perhaps it's a missing thing, uh, is the agency of the Palestinian people. I've been reading uh, uh, headlines and articles that talk about how, uh, who is gonna rule Palestine and what's gonna be necessary to the so-called international community in Palestine in terms of being able uh, uh, to uh, make a determination of the freedom of Palestine. I think that we have a responsibility not just to call for peace, but to unite with the oppressed peoples of Palestine, to oppose Israeli colonialism, to say victory uh, to the Palestinians against this hostile uh, aggression that has taken their country. So I want to say that uh, uh, on September 3rd, uh, the United States government uh, will be putting me on trial in Tampa, Florida. Uh, it would be uh, given their druthers, uh, I am facing a lifetime sentence. That is to say, me, Penny Hess, Jesse Neville, members of the Solidarity Movement, are now uh, facing 15-year uh, uh, sentences. Uh, we have been charged uh, with being Russian agents. We are charged with being Russian agents because our stand around the issue of the United States invasion, a murderous uh, campaign uh, in Ukraine. 
uh, the ongoing war that it's been making against Russia now for more than 100 years. You've got to remember uh, what we're looking at is the United States, along with every other colonial power in the world, attacked Russia uh, right after the, the Russian Revolution of 1917. Uh, they all invaded Russia. Uh, and, and since that time, they have been at war with Russia. Then it was called Soviet Russia. Since that time, they've created NATO, uh, which was an entity that was united all the colonial powers as, as a part of a project to contain or uh, destroy Russia. And it's that NATO that we see at work now in Ukraine. It didn't just start. The other thing I think that is important, at least from my perspective, uh, to convey to you uh, is that uh, we are informed by uh, this struggle that's happening, this this vicious murder that's happening uh, in uh, uh, against the Palestinian people by our recognition that that we live in a, in a within a colonial mode of production, a a social system that uh, came into existence some six hundred years ago uh, with the attack uh, by by Portugal in fourteen hundreds against Africa that the, began the process of dispersing Black people, that all of what has come to be known as Europe and the colonial powers engaged in for their own benefit and wealth and created for the first time in human history a global, a world economy. And that world economy is the one that has locked almost everybody uh, into this colonial mode of production. It's a parasitic kind of social system. It is the thing that has resulted uh, in the in the first imperialist world war uh, that we know as World War I, uh, where all of these colonial powers were engaged in uh, with these different pacts and, 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 and allies and what have you to, to divide the world. And that meant dividing Africa and everything else in the world. It resulted in, at that time, uh, shortly thereafter, the Pico, uh, 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 the, 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 the whole uh, France and England getting together and, and defining, creating the, the borders of most of what they call uh, the Middle East right now were created then. Uh, modern, what they call Lebanon, the more modern borders created then. Uh, it was this time that uh, also uh, we're looking at uh, the advent of the Zionist movement uh, and, and, and uh, uh, some of the people involved in the Pico uh, 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 arrangement that uh, led to the creation of the of the Middle East in terms of the borders now were also uh, supporting of the Zionist movement and its very conception. So this is what we're looking at. We're not looking at something that just started. We're looking at a whole mode of production that rests upon a foundation of oppressed peoples all around the world and African people, even in St. Louis where I live and where my house was bombed by, by federal agents uh, uh, on July 29th, uh, 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 2022, ostensibly because I needed Russians uh, to tell me that I was oppressed, that I'm working for Russians to sow dissent and discord uh, in this country, when the fact is there wouldn't even be an NAACP if there weren't already discord in this country. The mm -hmm. fact is that we were brought here as there's been discord. Africans have always fought against oppression and we continue to do so. But this is a part of a process too that is designed to negate uh, our history as a people. They're, that's the part of the process we're looking at in Palestine, negate the existence of Palestine, get rid of uh, Palestinians and say there is no Palestine. They're just Arabs in this territory, but no longer Palestine. And, and now we are facing a trial uh, where they want to limit the court, uh, if they can, the discussion in the court to this nonsense. I was working for Russia because uh, uh, I opposed the United States government's activity in Ukraine. Uh, because I uh, participated in organizing a political campaign in 2017 and 2019 in St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, that uh, demanded reparations for the for the historical oppression and exploitation of Black people, uh, that I initiated a process uh, to create, uh, collect signatures uh, for to win people to participate, uh, to demand that the United States uh, be brought before the United Nations uh, for uh, violation of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of uh, uh, Crime of Genocide that came about in 1948 by the United Nations. And, and four years after that, Black people were at the United Nations from this country uh, doing, making the same kind of demand. But we are told that, that the Russians are the ones who got us to do this, paid us to do this in the African People's Social Party, me, Penny Hess, and Jesse Neville. It's a ridiculous claim. And they would do this to negate the fact that we have history. So we can't talk about our history, given their druthers. 
we can only talk about some falsified notion that we work for the Russians. The fact is, they want to say we were created by white power, white people, uh, and now the, our crime is that we're looking for a new white master uh, to be able to tell us that we are oppressed. That's not true. We're not guilty of what they said. And I'm saying that September 3rd, I'm hoping that everybody here, everybody who is participating in this will come to Tampa, Florida with us because we can win. Because it's not just we who are under attack, because what they're doing, they will take someone that they assume uh, to be unpopular, and they will attack what's supposed to be the First Amendment right and constitutional rights of all the people. I didn't write the Constitution. It wasn't written for me. I wasn't supposed to have been included in the Constitution. That First Amendment was not written for me, but they can attack me, and then they can win solidarity, they hope with a number of white people who will agree with this attack on me, which means that they're agreeing with an assault on themselves because they're coming for you. And they just use Excuse me. Excuse me, Amali. You have three minutes left to finish your thoughts. Thank you. <laughs> I think I can do that. And uh, so <laughs> I, I, I want to appreciate everybody, everybody here. I hope you will come uh, to Tampa, Florida. And uh, because the people can be victorious, because what we've seen since this attack on us, what they're seeing is that if anybody has the same position that another country has or another government has, uh, then that means that you are employed by them and they can charge you as being their agent, which is mm -hmm. what they are trying to do in this case. Uh, we initiated a campaign in 1982. We held the first tribunal on reparations for Black people in Brooklyn, New York, using the 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 the, the world, using the the uh, uh, international law, including the UN Convention on the Punishment and Pre Prevention and Punishment of Crime of Genocide. We did that, but I'm not supposed to talk about that because that doesn't exist. So they would make me mute and dumb. And they would deny us history, and we were born uh, when we when white people discovered us, like they discovered America as a part of the whole colonial project. And now our crime is that we found a new white master to replace this white master, and that's what they would have us do. Just like they're saying now, who's going to control Palestine? Will it be this or will it be that? Will 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 a new uh, reformed Israel control Palestine or will some other force do that? So I just want to say thank you. And then also to invite you so we can have a further discussion, not just with me, but some incredible forces uh, at the uh, the convention of the, uh, of the Uhuda Solidarity Movement that's going to be occurring next weekend. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping that you will come to that and you can find out more about that. Uh, by registering uh, at no more genocide event b.com no more genocide event bee.com and our comrade Aaron Bushnell mm -hmm. is evidence of of the fact that people who if they can hear they will resist they try to shut me up mm -hmm. uh, Zuckerberg won't allow us to be heard the Times and Washington Post won't allow us to be heard. And that's why Aaron Zuckerberg took this extreme act so that he could be heard, so the world could hear free Palestine from the river to the sea. And also, he's the only white leftist you ever heard that used the reference to, 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 to apartheid, to colonialism, to slavery, to Jim Crow as a part of his declaration. He took a courageous stance, and we're inviting everybody to be like Aaron Bushnell, come to this convention that's going to be happening next weekend. Thank you so much. And thank all of you for the support that you've already extended to uh, the struggle that we're involved in. Uhuru. Chairman, it's this weekend. This weekend. Yes. I didn't say that? So this weekend. Yeah. Said this weekend. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Maybe someone can include the link in the chat if you haven't already. Good. Uhuru. Free Palestine from the river to the sea. Free Leonard Peltier, not one more year. Okay. Here's somebody, a native person on his own land, and they got him locked up for defending that land. That's the most ridiculous, obscene crime against the people. It didn't just start. It's been going on for a long time, and we have to stop it, and we can. The mm. people can be victorious. It's not that they don't want me to talk. They also don't want you to hear. Mm. And Aaron Bushnell heard, and that's the problem that they fear more than anything else. Thank you, Uhuru. Mm. Ooh, thank you so much for that, Amali. Got us all fired up and um, just grounding us in that history and reminding us of how far back this empire goes and will stop at nothing to remain um, the 
only superpower, crushing all their opponents. Russia wasn't even a threat to them when they went after them and started to attack and, um, you know, compete and build up these arms and create this entire war, um, which really um, has continued to this day. And um, I heard people say, like, all the wins that we made in the 60s and 70s, you know, that we were able to fight back are just, they've been trying to dismantle them, uh, you know, uh, subsequently ever since. And this is the kind of the culmination of what we're seeing today is just um, since the U.S. is being threatened with, uh, you know, China competing um, in the with the empire that they're pulling out all stops to take it down with Russia. And um, we're all getting caught in the crosshairs. But um, the Black Revolutionary Movement has been one that we are so grateful for and stand on the shoulders of and um, just provide all our love and solidarity and um, continue to fight shoulder to shoulder with. So i um, glad to support and spread the word amongst comrades, Palestinian um, and all otherwise. So um, let us continue that work. Um, we have a great legacy behind us and uh, ahead of us to continue. So looking forward to working with y'all um, on that. Uhuru. Uhuru. So our next speaker uh, is uh, here and welcome Christina. Uh, Christina Khalil is a member of the Green Party running for the U.S. Senate in New Jersey. She has called for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, humanitarian assistance for the population, and the resignation of the Israeli leadership. She supports a single state solution um, in Palestine. Christina. Hi, I am so sorry that I'm late. Um my laptop malfunctioned and I'm actually able to use my boyfriend's phone for Zoom. So I'm sorry the camera's not working. Um, so I just wanna also highlight quickly, not only for, um, that I'm calling for all that, but we're not having any climate organizations um, and I've only seen other Green Party members discuss it, but nobody's really talking about the environmental impact that this genocide is causing. And it's also causing generational trauma, but it, it's also destroying our um, our environment that's going to take decades to clean up. And then they're just ignoring it. And then at the same time, they're also going out of their way to endorse candidates like um, the there's one organization, the Sunrise Movement, they um they went and endorsed candidates that support the genocide and that haven't called out um that have that have voted to destroy this environment and i can't imagine what it's going to take to clean it up and also i've developed and i spoke with um madeline hoffman that uh about the um i have a, a policy to work on the generational trauma that also uplifts the the us economy and then at the same time um helps to develop redevelop palestine make it an independent state and give them their own infrastructure as well um and the goal is to help let them know like hey it's not all of us and to help unite the world but we're also not going to be focusing on just ending the genocide there, we're going to be focusing on ending the genocide in Congo and other places as well. Um, so does anybody have any questions so far? Oh, I think we're going to do questions after. Um, okay. Let's speak. Thanks. Yeah. I'm sorry. I have everything written on my laptop that I wanted to go over. So I'm trying to go over all this in my head right now. No worries. Um, if uh, if you know if you need to end earlier or um, you can continue, you know, um, in to elaborate in the question and answer if you prefer. Yeah, if someone asks me a question, it would definitely help trigger um what I wrote down. Sounds good. Okay, I think yeah. we can get to that. Um. After our final, but uh, last but not least, um, speaker, um, 
Thank you so much for that, Christina. And uh, good luck on your campaign. I'm really excited to hear about it and uh, I'm glad to support. Thank you. And sorry, I'm usually more prepared. Boys. <laughs> Um, so next we have the wonderful Dr. Jill Stein, uh, the Green Party candidate for president in 2016. In 2012, Jill is a leading anti-war activist and advocate for peace in the Middle East based on the recognition of the rights of Palestinians and a just permanent settlement. Um, Dr. Jill Stein. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, great. All right, great. All right, terrific. And I apologize, I'm in a noisy hall, but uh, hopefully it won't be too bad. I hope it is, and I'll do what I can to get people to quiet down. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate uh, that GPAX is hosting this forum. It's really an honor to be here with the other very distinguished speakers and a special um, shout out to Omali uh Yashatila for you know for really um you know standing up at incredible uh personal cost as he's done his whole life and you know just really uh just sending so much respect and and gratitude for your strong cause and urging all of us to do what we can to stand up together it's very much all of us who are in the target here is here uh in this assault on our you know, our our right to freedom of speech, freedom of political thought, um, you know, this the kind of targeting that's going on here is very familiar to me, having been uh, Russia gated in uh, 2016, you know, with a very concocted story just to know how the powers that be um, are trying to silence their competition that they are very much in fear of now. And it is, uh, I think, a sign of our power that um, you know that the heavy hand of censorship and political repression is coming down so hard now uh, on the left and on our freedom fighters. Um, so uh, just something for us to bear in mind because you know the 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 first casualty of war is always democracy at home, and there are so many ways that we are paying here at home for this very unjust war. And I want to say a few words about how the war on Gaza is really a symbol. It's kind of a microcosm of empire run amok, which it certainly has run amok, you know, throughout its history. Uh, but now, especially in its waning days, it is doubling down uh, in its final stages as an overextended and obsolete empire that is, um, uh, you know, attempting still to control a world which is no longer under its control. And as Ronald Reagan said, actually his uh, Secretary of Defense said in the 1980s that uh, Israel is the unsinkable battleship uh, for the United States, that is still you know, very much the case. And this is sort of the outpost of America uh, to control the major oil supply for the world. There was a time when we needed that oil. Now we are the major, you know, uh, exporter of fossil fuels uh, among the world's countries. But we want to still control that oil to be sure that no one else has their hands on it uh, without our approval. And you know, this is the policy of the United States uh, that goes by the title of full spectrum dominance. Uh, our dominance via Israel on the world's oil supply and our outpost in the Middle East is about maintaining that domination. Uh, I, I presume most people are familiar with the term full spectrum dominance on this call, but if you're not, it's the term that's been used by the Pentagon itself. And this was really formally enunciated in, the, uh, in approximately 1990 in the follow on to the fall of the uh, Soviet Union. This was the statement of the US empire that no power would be allowed to rise to compete with us. You know, we thought we were done, you know, with competitors with the end of the um, uh, Soviet Union. And, um, you know, time moves on. That's certainly not the case. Uh, and we are still attempting to not only suppress any, any global power, 
but full spectrum dominance says that we will not allow any regional power to rise either, which has certainly been, you know, the the motive behind the movement east of NATO uh, in order to um, entice uh, Russia uh, uh, and basically to suppress Russia and uh, to place nuclear compatible missiles on Russia's border, which is what Russia has essentially been fighting uh, to stop in in uh, in its uh, war in Ukraine. It was basically a fight for the neutrality of the of Ukraine. Hmm. Had the United States not, you know, refused to allow that, which we insisted on ourselves when Russia had moved its missiles into Cuba, actually in response to the U.S. placing our missiles uh, uh, in Turkey aimed at, uh, at at the old Soviet Union. So, you know, once again, we were instigating this uh, this crisis, and when Russia responded with its missiles, we were ready to launch uh, the. In fact. I believe the nuclear weapons were in the air. We had the bombs in the air. Fortunately, we had leaders at that point who were willing to talk to each other. Now we don't, uh, regrettably. Um, so, you know, the war in the Middle East, the uh, Israeli-US war on Gaza is another potential nuclear confrontation. Uh, and I just want to say a few words about that. Um, you know, first of all, just bearing witness, this genocide is not only a textbook case of genocide, it's really, um, you know, horrific uh, to see our blood drenched uh, screens, our iPhones, our computers, the TV screens. And it has been, in fact, so blood drenched as to have mobilized public opinion around the world, including even here in the United States where even back in November, we had 68%, according to Reuters, that uh, opposed this uh, assault, wanted an immediate ceasefire and a negotiated solution. More recently, 50% of the American public are now persuaded that this is a, gen a genocide happening on our watch, in our name, with our tax dollars. 80% of the weapons being dropped are US weapons. Um, and uh, you know the diplomatic cover that's being provided for Israel, the manipulation of UN votes. And again, we stand with Israel alone virtually and have overturned, or shall we say prevented, uh, otherwise more or less unanimous votes uh, by the world's nations to stop this genocide in its tracks. The decision of the world court recently calling this a plausible genocide that's actually as definitive a label as can be had in real time. The actual uh, label of genocide, unqualified, uh, can't be made until years after the fact. So this is as close as the World Court can come. They could have also ordered an immediate um, end to the, uh, you know, uh, an immediate ceasefire, which they did not do. But one could say that that it was implicit in their decision. At any rate. The world is really united to stop this, and the United States and Israel are making ourselves a pariah among world nations. You know, after we have overturned, after we have uh, conducted regime change on some 70 countries around the world since the Second uh, World War, that doesn't even include our military interventions. And according to the uh, uh, the Congressional Research Service, the U.S. has intervened militarily 250 times in the last 30 years that we have sent in our troops. So, you know, we have a pretty uh, uh, imperial approach to the rest of the world, but what's going on right now is so over the top. It's making us even more a pariah among the world's nations. I just wanna make the point, it's not only the people of Gaza who are endangered, it's also the people of Israel. And if there's any care or thought given for the future of the lives of Israelis, they too are very much in the target hairs right now because the neighbors of Israel are being really mobilized uh, against Israel. Uh, and there are a lot of forces arrayed against them. And to that, I wanna add that the uh, US now, our uh, reckless and criminal leadership is not only safeguarding Israel's right to conduct genocide, uh, but we are bombing now for other countries, Yemen, uh, Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq, 
We're also bombing Iranian targets, not yet Iran itself, although I believe Israel is, but we have not as the US uh, bombed targets inside of Iran. However, we're doing an awful lot to uh, antagonize uh, Iran and to pull the tripwires. Right now, people should be mindful that Iran now has a, a military agreement with uh, Russia, uh, a sharing of weapons and bases and so on. So by antagonizing Iran, we are potentially uh, instigating a potentially nuclear conflict. Israel is nuclear, of course we are. We have one nuclear sub that is known to be there. As far as we know, that is not nuclear armed but we have 14 other nuclear submarines which are nuclear armed. People should be mindful that one nuclear submarine holds the equivalent of 4,000 Hiroshima bombs. That's just in one. Yeah, 4, excuse me, Jill, you have, yes. uh, you have one minute to finish your thoughts. Okay, I'll wrap up very quickly. 4,000 Hiroshima bombs are enough to put us all into uh, uh, nuclear winter. So all of our lives are at stake here. How do we fight this? The key thing is that we've got to fight this together across multiple issues. We mm -hmm. do have a majority. We need to stand up and fight. And maybe that means a uh, general strike, that that might be a next step, clearly. you know. And we need to be an electoral threat. There will be one campaign on the ballot across the country that is fighting to stop genocide, to stop war, to fight on behalf of workers and on behalf of the global climate emergency. There will be one such campaign. On the other hand, other hand there will be four campaigns that are pro-genocide, pro-war, indifferent to the plight of workers or antagonistic to it, and likewise to the climate. So we may see potentially a four-way divide of the uh, pro-genocide vote and uh, one, one campaign across the country that will be against it. So it's important that we fight this on every front that we can, including electorally, as soon and as hard as we possibly can at the same time that we fight this on all other fronts. And I would encourage GPACs in particular to uh, consider helping to convene uh, further discussion about the general strike, which we've been discussing for quite some time, as mm -hmm. have many people. But the need for that is you know, like it never has been before. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Jill. Um... Very passionate, very impassioned, talking about the connections between issues um, and the, the election that's coming up. And I'm not going to say it's the most important election, because we're always told every four years, this is the most important election in our lifetimes. But it is a turning point election. It is one, I think, where it's possible I mean, we've already seen the abandoned Biden, the uncommitted people around the people around the country breaking, hopefully, not only temporarily, but permanently with the Democratic Party. And and um, then you have the Trump guy on the other hand. And well, I don't need to say any more. Um, so. Um, I'm glad that you were able to make it here. And I'm glad that, you know, I. I I was inspired by what you had to say. Um, I just want to start the question and answer session. Um, we have at least till 9.30, and if it goes very well, you know, if there's a lot of discussion and a lot of questions, we can continue uh, the question and answers. But I wanted to start because uh, I wanted to start with a... Um, Question for Christina, since she was asking for a question, and then um, I'm gonna we'll look in the chat and um, and ask the questions as as they arise. But for Christina, um, you said that there is an environmental impact on on Gaza, and not enough people are talking about it. And I. Um, I did some research and I don't exactly remember what I found, um, but could you answer that question? Could you answer the question of what some of the environmental impacts will be are and have been? Um, yeah, we have the, the soil getting destroyed. We have trees 
like the olive trees that are hundreds of years old, some of them that are being destroyed. We have a whole bunch of different agriculture. It's going to be hard for growing food and farming. Um, it, water resources completely destroyed. I remember even before October 11th, at one point, there was um, they were pouring cement into water wells to prevent Palestinians from drinking water. Um, so, and it's also harming the the um, what's the word I'm looking for, the ecology, um, the animals and all the other atmosphere. So it, it's becoming more of an unlivable habit and the, and I'm sure there's a ton of cancer causing chemicals that are also in the soil. So people that are living there without the proper team that goes in to clean it up or the proper, um, um, that, yeah, the proper team to go in and clean it up, then you're looking at the generational um, impacts of what are people being exposed to? Cause we have the white, I can never pronounce the word phosphorus gas. And that's just, sitting there and then we have um, a whole bunch of different bombs that have been going off so it's just it's going to be it's going to last a very long time and it's going to take a very long time to clean up it, it's really quick to destroy an environment and it takes years to clean up okay thank you and and then there was um a question from steve welzer directed towards matt ho um, and it was, it sounds like you think that uh, the greater Israel plan will be accomplished by Israel. And he wanted to know if he thought, if that, if he was misreading what you said or, or whether you thought that was actually going to be the case. Uh, I, uh, um, I appreciate the question, Steve. And uh, good luck to Steve in his own run uh, for the U.S. House in New Jersey. Um yeah, you know, Yogi Berra said uh, predictions are hard, especially when they're about the future. And I think there's so much complexity here, but on its current trend, on its current line, with the support from the United States, if the United States continues to give support it's given to Israel, if it, if Israel, if this government is able to stay in power in Israel, which is not, there's, there's nothing certain about that, as we all know, right? Uh, if, um, if they're able to not if they're able to stop their economic hemorrhaging uh, one thing that uh, it has not been covered much in this country is the enormous like, economic and financial toll this is taking on israel uh whether it's they've got a couple hundred thousand people who are displaced from both the south and the north in a country of eight nine million people that's a huge economic hit you have hundreds of thousands of mobilized reservists you have uh the closure of the port on the red sea uh, you have uh, the, the the stopping of tremendous amount of foreign investment coming into the country. All the you know all these different things add up and, and a considerable weight. But you know if they somehow can continue to go forward with this plan, with this government in power, with the back of the United States, I think they understand this is their best opportunity to achieve those goals. They will never get another chance to carry out the ethnic cleansing like they are doing right now. Right. They will never get another chance to uh, annex East Jerusalem and the West Bank as they may have in the coming year. Right. They will never get another chance to invade Lebanon for the third time. Why they would do that. But, you know, I mean, the recklessness of this, the strategic unsoundness of it. But this is, you know, the two wings in Israel that are in power right now are the militarist, uh, um, uh, 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 you know, militarist nationalists and religious nationalists. And so they're not beholden to the same worldview that we are. And they see this as their best chance. Now, you know, is it likely? I don't know. But is it possible? Absolutely. And I think that's something we have to keep in mind, that even if there were, we had a magic wand and we were to to wave it and, and end this horrible genocide tomorrow, uh, The this is just one aspect of the overall plan for greater Israel. And we have to be cognizant, uh, aware of it, and we have to do everything we can uh, to fight it. Hmm. I see your hand, uh, Janet and uh, Scott. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to add one thing, because um, I remember reading about the environmental damage about um, from the, the attacks on Gaza. Um, 
and this is something that's gone almost completely unreported, but The Guardian did cover it in saying that the planet warming emissions generated during the first two months were greater than the annual carbon footprint of more than 20 of the worst uh, climate vulnerable nations, the world's most uh, climate vulnerable nations uh, combined new research reveals, and there's tremendous research about the damage that it's doing um, to the environment. Um, but uh, Janet, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I want to go back to the failure to stop the killing um, and um, the, the UN, the dysfunctional UN, which is the only world body we have, even though it's design supports US hegemony. Uh, a UN General Assembly meeting on the use of the veto following the US veto cast in the Security Council on February 20th took place Monday and yesterday in three sessions for almost eight hours. I didn't listen to all of it, but most of the member states just used the meeting as an opportunity to bandstand and not address the veto issue. But I thought you might be interested in knowing that one country, Malaysia, came up with a formula for a new UN Security Council veto policy that would require that use of the veto be regulated, prohibited in situations that involve mass atrocity crime, and that a veto that's exercised by at least two of the five permanent members and supported by three non-permanent UN security members, followed by a majority vote of the UN General Assembly. Excuse me, Janet, do you have a question yeah. from one of the speakers? Well, I, I just I wanted to are. add, uh, um, contribute this and ask for feedback or, you know, uh, comments. But um, I, I think this might be doable, but not uh, in time to stop the killing of Palestinians. Um, I don't think the, the US and its crony states will end the killing, but I do think and hope there will be enough resistance from non-state actors like the Palestinian resistance, Ansar Allah, uh, some Arab and Muslim countries and others, perhaps Russia and China, and economic arrangements like BRICS will yeah. be able to- up, please? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just about done. Uh, well, one the, minute for questions. We've gotten quite a few more. <laughs> collective defeat of the U.S. imperialism and Israel's genocide and ethnic cleansing and create a multipolar world. So I, I'd, you know, if anybody wants to comment on that, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Well, thank you for that for that input. I'm just. Um... Does any do any of our speakers want to respond to what Janet just asked about uh, changing the rules in the UN um, so that the ceasefire vetoes that the US has exercised could no longer could no longer happen just from one country? Anyone uh, a veto of one country blocking everything? Anyone? Yeah. <clears throat> I'll jump in. Um, okay, Joe. Okay, yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that, Janet. And I wasn't aware that this discussion was going on um, right now, in fact. And, and if you have a link that you can post, that would be helpful. Um, I think this is, you know, a, a, a kind of fatal flaw in the structure of the United States that the, you know, the major powers can disrupt anything. And the U.S. has stood in the way of action on Israel uh, for decades. And uh, it is a critical issue uh, in how the U.N. functions. And we look <clears throat> to international law, we look to international law uh, to try to solve this. Um, but international law really can't function. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the world court by itself, uh, its hands are tied. Uh, the UN would need to really inflict um, sanctions, you know, very uh, intense sanctions on Israel, which should be invoked uh, as quickly as possible, but the U.S. is going to stand in the way of that. So the question about how to overcome the U.S. veto here really is critical, and um, I agree with you, it may not happen in time, but I think it's important to know about it, and it needs to happen eventually because there are a whole lot of other genocides, you know, going on and in the works 
Um, so yeah, I appreciate it very much, but I think the question is still in front of us. What else, you know, what is, what else can we do and what can we do now? And that, thank you, Jill. Um, anyone else want to answer that? Any one of the speakers, I mean, Omali, you have your hand up. Yeah, I think, I think it's an important, um, uh, intervention, uh, the, the question of the undemocratic uh, character, uh, one might even say nature of the United Nations, which it was uh, founded after the failure of the League of Nations, which was created uh, primarily uh, as a means by which the colonial powers uh, would be able to uh, have a peaceful uh, method by which they could uh, debate control of the world without having to go to war as they had done previously. And then, the, as you remember, the League of Nations was a consequence of the first imperialist world war, and then the United Nations came after the second imperialist world war. So that was essentially what that was about. And uh, most of the world uh, uh, colonized people had nothing to do with it, had nothing to do with creating the international law. It was law that was made uh, primarily by the colonizers. And the other thing I would say is that, that you know, we shouldn't be... Uh, you know, having you know, you know, deep despair. We cannot, uh, we cannot um, neglect to recognize that the agency of the Palestinian people themselves. The only reason we're having this discussion now is not because of the United Nations, not because of the United States, not because of anybody else except the Palestinians. The Palestinian resistance has brought this onto the table. Has made it necessary for us to now reconsider at this moment the question of the the democratic or lack thereof of the United Nations process. So the Palestinians, I think we have a responsibility, again, to be more than just championing, quote unquote, peace uh, or calling for peace, but to actually declare our solidarity with the Palestinian quest for the total liberation of Palestine and the Palestinian mm -hmm. people. I just think that's, that's the thing that's going to contribute to it. And remember, it's Palestine that now has Joe Biden in trouble. Uh, 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 it's the Palestinians who have taken, who have, you know, exercised agency, and we have to recognize that agency and not presuppose that all of these powerful entities out there will make the determination what would happen to the Palestinian people, independent of their own agency. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amali. Um, and yeah, I mean, even when discussing solutions uh, to the situation in Palestine. And Biden says this, and yeah, who says that? Somebody, no, it's what the Palestinians want. It needs to come from the Palestinians. What kind of state or what kind of situation they want? Um, I'm going to take a question from from the uh, from the chat, and then we'll go back to taking hands and uh, Nora. Uh, we'll take we'll call on people who have had their hands up. Um, I'm going to ask one that falls that flows right from this, and that's from uh, Susan Lamont, um, who said, um, "Well, what can okay, what can um, what can countries do? How can countries put more pressure on Israel if Israel has?" nuclear weapons and they may not be afraid to use them. That's for anyone, any one of our speakers. I go ahead, Jill. Uh, I'll defer, but since I just spoke, I'll defer if anybody else wants to jump in. Uh, if not, you know, I'll just say quickly that, you know, According to the ruling of the uh, World Court, you know, its preliminary measures uh, included that all countries need to step up to the obligations of the uh, Treaty Against Genocide, which requires actually what Yemen is doing, which is to interfere with the conduct of that genocide. There is so much that every country can do immediately you know, Joe Biden could stop this in the blink of an eye as uh, Ronald Reagan uh, brought the Israeli invasion back from Lebanon <clears throat> with a phone call. So this could be stopped immediately uh, by Joe Biden. 
um, and any country, you know, and, and I think in this country, we have to do everything we can to force his hand. Uh, it's a, you know, I think Gaza is just the tip of the iceberg of the, uh, you know, of, of the criminality of U.S. empire and how it operates. So it's a bigger problem than Gaza, but there is something we can do about Gaza immediately. Israel is very dependent on the, on the U.S. for the conduct of this war. So everything that we can do, uh, in spite of how much money the arms dealers have, uh, still Joe Biden has the power to stop this, uh, as Congress does. And any country can begin to uh, boycott and uh, sanction Israel, as some countries have begun. Um, so, you know, I, I think pulling out all the stops on completely sanctioning Israel uh, for this genocide is really critical. Mm -hmm. Thank right. you, Jill. Okay, yeah, I wasn't sure if you want to jump in, but um, I do want to call on Scott, but in addition, I thought we could take another question that came early on. Um, that may be able to fold into uh, Scott's question that, um, so just make sure it gets addressed. Sharon, Cheryl asked early on, um, I think um, when we were talking about empire dying, um, that was Matthew's um, topic, like what happens to those of us within it when it dies? I think that's a really important question to address. And um, Scott, if you want to go ahead and add yours uh, to the mix. Take yourself off mute first. Are we live? No, yep. uh, first of all, an old hello, long overdue. Hi, Jill, long time no see. Uh, <laughs> a, couple, a couple of things. Um, a question goes to um, the infra issue of environment and infrastructure. And one of the backdoor uh, issues that arose in the wake of the moving of the US Embassy to Jerusalem was the fact that Israel came out with new maps annexing, effectively annexing the, uh, the West Bank. And an untold part of this story is the fact that they basically have seized control of the Jordan River aquifer and the whole watershed, which is really decisive as to whether anyone else can run their own lives and the viability of Palestinian settlements and, and state in that region which may, you know, permanently alter the landscape. So I want to throw the question out about what kinds of measures will be necessary to, to allocate those water resources fairly and change that situation. Um, and just to, to close briefly, I, I put a little offering in the chat. I was torn up about this for weeks. I put together an essay called Gaza Trails of Tears. I put the link in the chat. And, uh, and the theory there is that uh, we're, we're trapped in kind of dialectics historically of blame and retribution and these guys and those guys forgetting that there's certain pathological characters, uh, political actors who uh, basically played provocateur politics and the idea of provocateur politics can be really liberating and gives us a basically a way of isolating those crazies from the people who whom they victimize on both sides. And uh, so I want to put that out there and share that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Because um, there are two questions out on the table, right, Nora? There's what happens when the US empire dies? Mm -hmm. And then what about um, the, vi the what's happening with, uh, with Israeli uh, annexation of property um and how is that how right, is so resources right water resources, water and resources yes. you know i think that's kind of part of the question of empire is it's all a fight and battle for resources right um who wants to take that on the empire won't die it has to be killed mm. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's not going to die a natural death. And uh, we do that by starving it of this parasitic uh, connection with the rest of the people. Mm -hmm. We support all the struggles against colonialism that's happening everywhere in the world. 
uh, and starting with Gaza if we have, or we can start right here in North St. Louis. We support all of the struggles against colonialism. This is the thing that starves empire, can't live without that. Uh, mm -hmm. It rests upon that foundation of colonial uh, terror and, and acquisition. So it's a parasite. And like every parasite, it has to have a host. And so we can unite. We can unite and uh, join this struggle, not just to cry tears you know, for uh, the poor and for the oppressed, but to unite uh, in the struggle to end that oppression uh, and that poverty by starving the parasite. So uh, it won't, it's not going to just go away. I mean, I think that's what we've heard from some of the people who've spoken to now, you know, the greater Israel and all of this stuff, you know, from, you can't say, you can't say from the river to the sea, but you can say from sea to shining sea, right? This is, this is the way it is. So the empire will not, it was not going to die. It's not going to commit suicide. We have to play the role. That's, we have to use agency ourselves and not, rely on some institution that we don't necessarily have any control of, although we can do everything we can to you know, give direction to the, those institutions, but it's our responsibility. So thank you, Uhuru. Anyone else to yeah. address those questions? Sorry, Nora, this is your question to handle. No, no way. Yeah. The, the, the other question was about the resources. Is that right? About That's uh, right. Yeah, yeah, I mean, th this kind of gets back. You know, when you're there, when you're in Palestine, and you're 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 in the West Bank, uh, and you'll see how vital and scarce the water is, and how the Israel uses water against the Palestinians. Uh, you know, to 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 choke the life out of them, basically. And you'll you'll see that most of the Palestinian homes and buildings have water tanks on them, and you can see where those water tanks have been repaired because the Israeli army and the border police and the settlers will shoot those water tanks just to just to just to 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 make life harder, right? And that's the whole aspect of the occupation is the humiliation of it, the constant degrading, the constant misery, the constant hardship. Right. Make it so that you, you will chase these people off their land. And so you recognize that the use of resources that is a vital tool of the occupation. You have to cut that off. But it gets back to this point again about the institutions involved and whether or not any question that was brought up earlier, uh, particularly regarding the U.N., whether there are any uh, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's institutions or alliances of nations that could actually make a difference in terms particularly of, of maybe sanctioning Israel or of forming some other, using some other type of mechanisms uh, to force the uh, removal of Israeli hands off of those resources, whether it be water or what have you. That's a very difficult thing. It's, it's a very effective mechanism that Israel uses to make life horrible for the Palestinians and to pursue their goal of, of cleansing uh, the occupied territories. But uh, yeah, I wish I had a, a, a better answer, but it gets back to this idea of that we have to take these institutions. The idea of asking what can other nations do, I think that's looking, to, we're looking at it the wrong way, right? We, 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 we have to look at what can we do in our own nation. And so to go uh, back to what Omali was just saying, you know, uh, as well as then to the purposes of, of this meeting here, you know, and who's sponsoring and the fact that we have Jill's running, Christine is running, Steve is running. I'm not sure if there's other folks running, but we have to support them every way we can. Because, and that's just one aspect, right? The electoral strategy is just one aspect of what we have to do. But certainly this idea that other nations uh, will come to our aid and answer these problems for us when we, the United States, are the empire, we have to we have to take it we have to dismantle it from within we have to destroy it from within as amali was saying and you know it's a heavy lift but you know there's no other alternative um we have a couple more we have three hands in the room um should we i, I guess the speakers go first and then we have james bronke and kim Are Madeline, are, are, are you recognizing me with that? I'm not sure. I don't want yes, to. Yes, I was okay. recognizing you with right, that. Great. In a backhanded way, I'm sorry. All right, thanks. And I'll just, I'll be quick, but I, you know, I think people may remember how Israel 
threatened repeatedly to flood the tunnels uh, in Gaza with salt water, you know, which was also going to like permanently destroy the aquifer. And, you know, it's just like the, um, the cruelty and inhumanity that's being uh, asserted by Israel is just so off the charts right now. Um, I, you know, it's not like we need to rely on other countries, but other countries are going to do their thing too. You know, other countries are are horrified. Uh, not that they don't have their own corruption and their own, um, you know, subservience to uh, empire. Some of them, but many of them not. So, uh, and this sort of interfaces with the other question about what happens as empire dies. Well, one of the things that happen is that other rising powers uh, contest with that empire. And when you're seeing the US bombing a lot of other countries and kind of running uh, right into explosive conflicts, both here in the Middle East by generalizing this war, the $17 billion that, you know, that um, Congress wants to put into uh, the Middle East is not just for Israel to conduct genocide, it's also to expand this war. Um, you know, we've got several fronts of confrontation that have really been uh, provoked and exacerbated by uh, U.S. foreign policy, and we're asking for it. You know, so part of what happens if empire is allowed to run amok like this is that you get beat up. You get very badly beat up. And remember, in each of our trillion or multi-trillion dollar recent wars, we've lost. We lose and we spend down our resources and this is very dangerous for us. Uh, the BRICS alliance, you know, now exceeds the US in its economic reach and its economic resources. So uh, the US is meeting its match right now and um, we're in for a very rocky road. In my opinion, it's really helpful to remind people of that, that we are all in the target here, here whether you're looking at nuclear conflict or the cost of war, $50,000, according to uh, Jeffrey Sachs at uh, Columbia University, the cost of war since 2001 uh, to the average American household has been $50,000 uh, that we've basically been subsidizing the Pentagon. This year alone, it's $12,000. It's very important for people to know about this and hear about this because it does help. You know, our campaign was just in East Palestine, not known to be a bastion of progressive politics. Um, but people were so in much in agreement about how our tax dollars are being squandered on these wars that are just endangering us. So I think there's really potential, you know, perfect storm going on right now for absolute political upheaval and transformation. Um, and as people, you know, come to understand that we are very much in the target here, as they start to get the point that, you know, this is uh, forget the lesser evil, you know, and any talk, any misleading talk about the lesser evil. We got two greater evils uh, that we're fighting with. In fact, more than two, if you count some other warmongers and genocide mongers out there. So it's a really no. great time to be pushing. Can you, Jill, can you finish up your uh, thoughts? I'm done. Okay. Thank you. Right on side. Okay, throw it to you, Nora. Thank you. Um, uh, before we go to the next hand, um, just a question that's come up a few times on the chat is about the weapons and how are we going to end um, the U.S. or just any weapons and the, the nature of weapons, um, banned weapons, depleted uranium and white phosphorus, um, if uh, someone can answer that, I think we could take a few questions at a time. That way, we're um, you know maximizing our time here. Okay, Kim, if you could uh, unmute and go ahead. Right. Thank you. Um, one of the things that that you know there's been little talk of, and and I'm speaking larger in a larger term. You know, I'm I'm delighted to see people talking about the empire. But one of the things is that most of the opposition uh, uh, to the empire seems to be electorally. And I think while that's important, and we should certainly have to push that, that is, and it's necessary, it's not sufficient. What we've got to do, and I don't think the left has done 
done much at all has been to organize in our own communities and tie this together. So for example, um, the US national debt has exploded $33 trillion just in the last 40 years. Mm. You know, it's going to come back and it's going to affect ordinary people and what, and it has. What has been happening is that the masters of the empire have been diverting resources for the American people for education, healthcare, environmental protection, et cetera, et cetera, and they've been channeling it into the empire. Uh, between Ronald Reagan's election in 1981 and the end of Trump's term, me, Kim, the U.S. Is... Do have um, a question for the, any of the speakers? Um, the, yeah, the larger, the larger question is, is what are we going to do about this? And I'm, are, I'm suggesting that electoral is, is important but not sufficient. So I'll just leave that for their comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Anybody want to take that? Nora, do you want to take a couple other questions? Or no? Because there's two more hands in the room. Okay, yeah. Let's uh let's go with Barbara. Well, James has had his up his hand up for a while. James Frankie. Yeah. No. Okay. Uh can I go? Please, yeah. We'll okay. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't. Uh, you know, there has been quite a little talk about what do we do. That's the real challenge. What do we do? And as someone who's worked on the design of actually a nuclear weapon at one point in my life and other weapon systems, I feel a whole hell of more, more concern for our country than uh, the average person. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, and what I will say is that looking across uh, like Facebook uh, comments and stuff, the American people are waking up to this issue. Many of my, you know, older friends are like, you know, this is BS. This has been going on for a long time. And so a lot of people are speaking up and you're seeing pro-Palestinian uh, postings on Facebook all over the place. Uh, now, what we have to do is we have to look at the root cause of the problem. First off, first off, you're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. We are part of the problem. That, that means the United States of America. And because we Excuse aid me, Israel. Jim, do, do you have a question for one of our speakers? Your time no, is I, up. I, I, I'm, I am answering the question of what do we do? This is the question, and I'm answer going to answer that. You don't. You and don't what, have the question for the speakers, then. Well, Thank they you. can comment on what on what I have to suggest. Okay, what we need to do is phase out our aid for Israel, and we have to insist that they become an equal rights nation. Well, uh, one of the basic facts of our constitution is separation of church and state. Everyone has to be treated equally. Let's give the uh, speakers a chance to comment on your your uh, what you said. They can comment on that one right there. Right, uh, right. Mm -hmm. We have three questions on the table. I think we have at least two. Right. Um, one was um, that About weapons. We have weapons, but there was one before that that Kim was talking about that electoral politics are a part of the problem, or part of the answer, but not the whole answer. And we need to be doing other things, kind of in line with what Omali had said earlier. You know, this is there's a lot of organizing that needs to be done. So that's one. And then the second one is what uh, what what our friend just talked about in terms of nuclear weapons and the fear of nuclear weapons. There are a lot of people waking up. And what do we do with that? How do we how do we move ahead with that? So um and I also want I also need to say it's 948. So we have like 10 minutes more. So I think Jim is going to be a little more strict. <laughs> um and um we'll try to get as many questions in, right? Yes, yes please can. make your questions short so we can hear from the speakers. And everyone else in the room who has a question, there's quite a few. 
Any of the speakers want to take the questions on the table? Well, I have a question. I, I will put a very simple question. That is, how do you feel about the idea of creating a Palestinian property claim database where I will take claims from the Palestinians for what has been lost, uh, but that what have they have lost to Israel? And we will submit it to our Congress. And this is the bill to the Palestinians that we owe them. What do you think of that idea? Well, that, that already yeah. exists through the Very UN. long list. And yeah, yeah, there are folks, people working that, on this. Yeah, that, that already exists. Well, you know? I'd like to know where. Tell well, where. One, one place is the UN uh, Refugee and Welfare Agency for Palestine that has been defunded by the United States. And then at the House passes the foreign aid supplemental that the White House wants to have passed, the Senate had passed, then it will be an act of, it will be against U.S. law for the United States to fund UNRWA. So one of the things that I see here is a, 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 all three questions intersect in this issue of money and power, right? What happens is the things you're all talking about, about the organization and mobilization, uh, that was effective, right? So, so much success with that in the Vietnam War, so much success with that civil rights movement, with the environmental movement, look at the nuclear movement in the early 80s, and the establishment, the system, the elites, whatever you want to call them, they evolved, they insulated themselves with cash, with money. And so what matters in our system is money. And until we undo that, until we, this is what the Israelis understand. This is why the Israelis control the Congress and the White House so well through their lobbies, just as all the other industries do, all the other special interests, just like big pharma, the weapons industry, the banks, whoever you want to talk about, right? So we have to understand what the actual issue that we're up against is, is this system that's controlled by money. And so, I mean, we, we can't just have this headlong rush into it, expecting that it's going to obey us because of our moral authority, right? And we can have the moral authority, but the system doesn't care about the moral authority. So either you reform the system or you tear it down. And I'm not sure which one has any chance of hope. But I'll, I mean, I want to turn it over to Christine or Robert because we haven't heard from, 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 from those in a while. And I'm sure I'm sure Amali has some has some words on this as well. I think Christina had to leave so we can go to Robert. If he has an answer, yeah, uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't have an answer. Um, I think that you know, educating people about what's going on there is important. But there are so many issues, you know, like, uh, like has been talked about. Um, there's the issue of money influence in our our political. There's the influence of the media. Um, you know, I kind of agree to a certain extent about the political system, but a lot of that has to do with ignorance. Um, what, uh, you know, we have wasted and the Palestinians have suffered so much from talking about peace. You know, the problem with peace, as I see it, is that a land without a people is not peace. You know, the minds of indoctrinated youth in, within Israel, both the Israel blames the Palestinians for everything that Israel is doing. Palestinians don't indoctrinate their kids. They, they can't. Their kids survive. You know, they have to, they shield them for the most part from what's happening to them on the outside, or they'll be absolutely devastated. They don't keep their kids safe, quite the opposite. Uh, this is really a complicated issue. I don't have the answers for it. What I do <laughs> is the only thing that I feel I can do is I go there and uh, do what I can. I mean, it's a human, it, 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 um, it's a crisis of humanity. That... Somebody's needs to mute. Uh, there's some odd noises coming through. Um, 
don't know who's okay that's better um i can i i want to answer just say two things one is that um there are efforts right now underway by this company to sell stolen land land stolen from the palestinians on the west bank um and they're coming they're coming to new jersey this week i think mm -hmm. um or in four days they they're going to be in flatbush they're going to be in lawrence new york and they've been in in canada in two locations so that's one thing and people are organizing against it because it violates international law yes tnec um New Jersey, it violates international law and or and and national law both, um, and state law as well. Um, so that and that's one thing. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that there are some efforts, and I've been a part of one. Um, yeah, Occupied Palestine is a Zionist real estate project. Thanks, Janet. Um, and one is to stop the house demolitions on the West Bank in East Jerusalem. Um, in East Jerusalem, um, it's because the, the demolitions of the homes of the, the Jerusalem mayor says it's to build a theme park, a biblical theme park um, to uh, King David, King David. I mean, the, the reasons are absurd. Anyway, those are two things that are going, that are that are happening right now on the issue of prop. Other things that are happening on the issue of property, and attempts to protect the housing. Okay, Nora, you had some things you just posted. Yes, this is to uh, protest the the real estate sale um, in New York, and our comrades from um, Elauda and uh, um. Other diaspora like Palestinians will be leading that effort um, and are on sort of the front lines and trying to build uh, some power to continue to fight against that on the legal front and economic as well. Um, so definitely support their work. And just one thing about the, the, the failing empire that I really feel is important to say, I don't think there's any like foregone conclusions of what is to come. But one thing we know is that when and if we are able to get organized like we need to, that will reduce the level of violence that will be enacted upon us in ways that I think are very real and amassing at the doors and banging down our doors as we speak. And the most beautiful thing about this moment is people are coming out the woodworks and just meeting each other for the first time and building our powers in way uh, power in ways that I have never imagined I would see in my lifetime. And the, you know, it's incumbent upon us to just continue to build this momentum and power in really clear ways. And anyone who's um, working on that, um, you know, just across movements, you know, struggling with the uh, Black, Palestinian, Indigenous, you know, equal rights for all peoples, um, is the only way forward that's going to, you know, um, allow for any dignity and humanity. And, you know, really Gaza is providing us that, that um, opportunity to, to lift us up and to, you know, bring us together in ways that, um, you know, I was a little, I led the Oakland ceasefire resolution city council and every single city council member would tell us like, oh, we can't do that. It's so divisive. And, um, against all odds and obstacles, um, Palestine brought us together every single time that, um, you know, there was any um, opposition, like it, it really just, that was the main thing I kept saying is like, let Palestine bring us together. It doesn't have to be this divisive issue and that it can show us who our true um, comrades are. So um, thank you, Nora. But, can you but, finish up your thoughts? Of course. Um, so I think uh, Barbara, were you next? Oh, yeah, Don Fitz and then Larry. Too. Yeah, this is uh, Don using Barbara's uh, computer. I want to follow up. My question follows up on what Matthew said a few minutes ago about how do we stop the U.S. at home and Kim's comments about electoral politics. I want to mention that I lived through the Vietnam War. And one of the things that I remember very 
and I went to jail like many other people who opposed the Vietnam War. And I remember very early on, people said, you cannot stop U.S. imperialism. It is much too strong to do anything. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we did stop U.S. imperialism against Vietnam. And uh, there have been many explanations of why or how we did it. And I would offer one explanation I heard from somebody that I thought was the best. And it was all the wild and crazy things that people did together, the massive disruption of every aspect of American society, by demonstrations, by sit-ins, uh, by disruptions of not letting things happen. And oh, as far as Kim said, that elections are not everything, elections are extremely important. But remember that the most progressive things that have been done in, in U.S. politics in the last 50 or 60 years were done under the Richard Nixon administration. I still totally want to interrupt the, you, uh, Don, but um, would any of the uh, speakers like to comment on that? What, what, could I finish with my thought? Make it quick, because you're over your time limit now. So make it as okay. quick as I, I didn't know what my time limit was. Uh, so, I, I mean, during the Nixon era, the Vietnam War was ended, the EPA was created, China was recognized, abortion rights were uh, gained. And so what this, the reason why all of these things were done was because of the massive disruption that occurred throughout American society. And so, yeah, we, we do need to worry about a fascist coming in uh, with Donald Trump. But whenever I'm collecting signatures to put the Green Party on the ballot in Missouri, I already, always tell people that a fascist is already in the White House and his name is Joe Biden. All right, so we have, thank you, Don, for that. And we have Larry, we have, it's 10, it's 10 o'clock and 10 was our absolute, like <laughs> the longest we were going to stay. Um, so but there are, I just want to say Haiti. Okay. Yeah. It's a big, it's, that's it. That's all you wanted to say. Don. Yeah. Okay. But I'd like some comment. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Um, I don't know if we can, if we have closing remarks from speakers, that's going to be another, there's four people, so they have to be less than a minute, okay? And Jim, are you up to the, are you up to that task? Okay. And so the, the other person, we've got Larry, um, was there another person with a hand up that I missed? Oh, yeah. yeah. Jill. Hi. Yeah, I know, but we're going to do closing remarks, okay? Because we, we can't, it's 10 o'clock already, all right? Um, and so um, so we have Haiti on the, on the, on the, on the floor <laughs> to be commented on. Also, if we, people could post the best places to donate to Palestinians, I've seen a lot of questions about that. I saw an answer from Matt Cole in regard to UNRWA. I'm getting I'm getting messages from someone else and I can't I have to keep focused on what we need to wrap to do to wrap up. Um and so if some people can post in the chat, I know some people did. Um yeah, and we have Steve Showen to make an announcement about an upcoming webinar. All right, looks like we're gonna need 10 more minutes, okay? To 10, 10 15. To, to accomplish all of this, but we ask everybody to be respectful in terms of the time that they take. Um, so um, let's start. Nora, you can you want to call the speakers in the order that they spoke um, to to do a one one minute wrap up, and then we'll you know we'll, oh actually we should probably give Steve show and we we did say we would allow for the update on the. Um, in the upcoming webinar. So let's do this. Steve. Yes, you, you can hear me okay? Yeah, can, can you okay. do it in a minute? Yeah, well, I'll give it a try. Uh, oh. Next next month's webinar goes sort of directly to the point that Matthew Ho made uh, is that we're up against a system controlled by money. So uh, the subject is titled Degrowth by Monetary Reform, Money for the People by the People. And it's, I'll read it very brief blurb, P 
People are drowning in debt and suffering from inadequate health care, rising inflation and endless wars. We must degrow the destructive economic system that enriches the financial elite at the expense of people, planet and peace. The privatized money system is unstable and wreaks havoc as it grows exponentially. The party's Greening the Dollar initiative outlines how to scrap the Fed for a constitutional system that circulates permanent, stable, and debt-free sovereign public money. This will allow us to grow a caring economy that nurtures what we hold dear. If I may say who the speakers are, Howard Switzer from the Banking and Monetary Reform Committee of the Green Party will be the moderator. Greg Coleridge is from Move to Amend and Alliance for Just Money. Richard C. Cook is from the American Geopolitical Institute. Mark Young is from the International Movement for Monetary Reform. And Fernando Lugo is from the Alliance for Just Money, who will talk about their May Day for Money event in May at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. Thank you very much. Can you put the information in the chat too, Steve? I uh, I don't have it available. I can show I can show you a screen share, or I can I we'll be sending it out. We'll All be right. sending it out. And the, and the date for it again? It's April third. April third. Okay. April third. So mm -hmm. have some time, but yes, April third on money. Yeah. Okay. So and now we I guess we have closing quick look very quick closing comments. All right, you want to kick us off, Matthew? Do we do two minutes? Minute and a half. <laughs> uh, for people who want to support Palestine, uh, my recommendation is support UNRWA. You can go to their website. Uh, you can do that in the U.S. I know in the U.K. you can't do that or you were not able to do it, but uh, certainly you can do it in the U.S. still. Uh, um, uh, Amali, it was a, a, a great honor uh, to be on here with you. Uh, please, everyone, sign up for uh, their their uh, convention this weekend and support uh, the Uhuru. Uh, I can't state how important that is. Uh, and then, of course, we here in North Carolina, we had 88,000 people yesterday vote uh, no preference. That's our version in North Carolina of uncommitted. And uh, those 88,000 people need to know that Jill Stein is running. Uh, we have a tremendous opportunity in 2024 to disrupt the political system, to disrupt the established order. And it will only happen if everybody does their part. People can't vote for Jill or won't vote for Jill if they don't know she's running or don't know anything about her. So please support Jill Stein, uh, support Amalia Nahoro, and uh, UNRWA as well. Well done. Thank you, Matthew. Next, uh, we had uh, Robert. Yeah, um, I, I I think it's important to uh, the um, BDS campaign is very important. Uh, Israel has been setting the rules as far as, you know, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable um, in, you know, supporting the Palestinians. Uh, meanwhile, they're completely erasing them. And that's part of the problem. Nobody knows that Palestinians have culture. Uh, they had a, a, a strong society, you know, before the, the Zionists took over. Uh, there's a great web broadcast called the, the Palestine Museum, which mainly focuses on their art. Um, and uh, it's really a, a very rich culture. I, I would highly suggest going there and telling people what you found. Um, they still have this image of, you know, um, a society humanized that they're terrorists, that, you know, they're everything bad. And, and I think it's really important to dispel that misconception. Uh, that was very motivating for me. Um, and, uh, you know, as far as, you know, the political stuff, I, I don't have a lot, uh, a lot of uh, background on that. Uh, but I think given Israel's reaction to BDS. Can you, I, Bob, can you, can you finish up your thoughts? Yeah, I think, I think BDS is an effective tool. That's why they're fighting it so hard. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, 
Next, we have Omali. Please, uh, please take it from here. Thank you very much. I'll be expeditious and at the risk of uh, being redundant, I was want to repeat, uh, free, free Palestine from the river to the sea. Can't victory, say that enough. Victory to Palestine. Uh, secondly, free Leonard Peltier, not another year. We have to make that commitment. Free the Uhuru three. Uh, go to hands off Uhuru. That's U H U R U dot com dot org. Hands off Uhuru dot org. Uh, participate this weekend in the Uhuru Solidarity uh, Committee convention. Um, uh, no more genocide uh, in my name. Uh, that's going to be at 8 a.m. Uh, at the Uhuru House in St. Louis, uh, located at 4101 West Florissant. And uh, you can go, that's going to be on the 8th and the 9th, and you can go uh, to register at nomoregenocide.event.com. Uh, uh, nomoregenocide.eventbe.com. -E Thank you very much, everybody. For being so gracious. And again, I want to express appreciation for the Green Party for offering the support that you already have in terms of this fight back. We're going to win. Uhuru. We have to win. Yeah. Much love and solidarity. Uhuru. Uh, I think next we had uh, Dr. Jill Dying. Yep. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. All right, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so again, uh, ditto that. Uh, thank you so much to uh, GPAX for uh, putting together this wonderful forum. Thank you so much to the speakers and to everybody who attended. Um, so much uh, wisdom here in the room. Uh, and again, I wanna underscore support for uh, Omali and the Uhuru struggle, uh, you know, they're coming for all of us. It just happens to be Omali at the moment. Um, this is, we're all in the target hairs here and really urge people to do whatever you can to support this struggle. Um, and then, you know, in response to, you know, the thoughts about how complicated this problem is, how it exists at many levels, the corruption of our government, you know, the power of the empire, uh, got to get money out of politics, you know, where do we start? I, I just want to underscore that this is a perfect storm right now, that people are in rebellion, uh, people are sick and tired, uh, if not of our foreign policy, although many are and many get the connection, people have had it with the economic hardships at home right now, which are really off the charts. Uh, so this is really a great time. And I want to point to what just happened in Michigan. And congratulations to North Carolina on your uh, eighty thousand, uh, you know, un, uh, un, uh, untargeted votes. Uh, but in Michigan, and and this isn't to say this is not different. Just saying that in Michigan we have the data not only of the number of people who voted uncommitted, which was a hundred thousand, but half of people stayed home, which is about half a million. So it's not just the uh, uncommitted vote. It's also the people who are voting with their feet uh, mm -hmm. saying that, uh, you know, that they refuse to participate in supporting the Democrats right now. So there is an explosion of voters who are now available to, um, you know, to, to rise up against the uh, parties of war on Wall Street. And so this really is a powerful, unprecedented moment right now. And I just wanna end with the words of Alice Walker, that the biggest way people give up power is not is by not realizing we have it to start with. We have unprecedented power. This is all about our organizing, doing everything we can to stop this war, to obstruct this war, to you know throw our bodies on the gears of the uh, military industrial complex in whatever way there's incredible disruption of the war effort going on. We need to keep that up, redouble it. And in my opinion, we also need to start thinking about the general strike and bringing together groups, especially now that many labor groups are seriously opposing the war. Um, we can take this to a whole new level. 
And uh, this needs to be an electoral battle too. And simply by standing up to declare our electoral opposition, it's not enough to not support genocide. We have to support opposition to genocide and to make that, uh, and to make our action and our commitment clear right now so that we can more effectively push the envelope right now to stop the war. So just keep it up and don't take no for an answer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. Madeline, you want to take it, close us out? You're on mute. <laughs> Quick point of information, if possible, in that link I provided, there are the email addresses to the Israeli embassy and three consulates in the United States to tell them what the hell you think. That's all. Okay, no, thank you. And and I know this has all been recorded. Can we make sure, please, uh, to, to save the chat? Because there were a lot of links in the chat. There were a lot, there were some questions in the chat that we didn't get to answer. Um, and as soon as we have the uh, the recording available, um, I hope we can also have um, the chat available. And I don't know, we might be able to share some of the questions with the speakers, ones that were not answered. Um, and um, I think that's it. Uh, uh, I to see you all in the streets. Yeah, we, we is got it to... possible? Is it possible to send us the chat? That's if, I, I don't I, know for sure. I, 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 gave, I gave my email in the chat because because my was I was on the phone because I was working, so most of the chat I didn't get to read. Well, if we can, we will. I think you can. I think you can save it as a file. Um, no, but I, but I missed. Were, I missed I all. Of it. I don't know. I'll send it. I'll send it to you, Donna. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I don't want to promise something we can't keep. All mm. right. So anyway, yeah, everyone in the who is here can save it themselves. Um, but I think we're gonna save it. I hope we save it as G as G packs as well. All right, on that note, thank you to everybody. Uh -huh. and, Free Palestine. Thank Free and Palestine, agree. Free Leonard Peltier. Yeah, Thanks yeah. everybody. Hands off the Uhuru three. Hands off the Uhuru. Please. Yes. Uhuru. 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 Uhuru.